Well, greetings, brethren. If I asked you a question, and that question is, what are the needs of the brethren? What are the needs of the brethren today? Or what are the needs of the brethren at large today? Uh, what would you say? What would you say to such a question? And I was thinking about maybe pausing, doing an interlude here on this portion of the of this video message to say, uh, give you five to 20 seconds to think about, about that. But you know what, I'll, th I'll think I'll just carry on and allow you to collect your thoughts as we go along here in this, in this presentation. You know, have you thought about it lately though, what the needs of the brethren are? I'm sure most of us have. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately, and there's a couple of reasons for it, and there's a couple of reasons why. And I'm not talking about the needs of the world. Let's just get that out of the out of the picture for for a while. Uh, many talk about how the world needs God, and many get very angry at the world and how it needs to repent and it needs God in their life. But that's but that is not coming about in a way that many think it should, and. Um, this is not the topic that we're discussing here today. So I want to keep make that, that clear. It's the needs of our brethren, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Their needs are far more personal to God than the needs of the world. And we, rec we can recognize that. And there's indications in Scripture that that's the case. We can look at Matthew 25 and verse 40, and say the, and the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So something there suggests that it's very personal to him. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, these are scriptures that have come to mind, and I'm sure there's a number of others that you may think of on your own. And whoever gives one of these, uh, Matthew 10, verse 42, excuse me, and whatever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, as surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So in terms of needs, let's talk about needs. For the purposes of what we're talking about here, uh, let's consider to separate the physical from the spiritual. In other words, separating physical needs which we're very well aware of, and also spiritual needs in terms of where we're, where we're going. And I was thinking about this, and as you're preparing for presentations, your thoughts carry you in different places. And, but when I think about the physical, the needs are never truly satisfied, are they? Uh, there comes a point where, just if we take it out to the fullest extent or the fullest extreme, there comes a point where the body no longer can be sustained. You can't fix or heal it anymore in terms of our physical physical needs. No matter what you feed the body, you know, what nutrition you do, and you know, what no therapy we do, whatever rest we can get, it can't be fixed or healed uh, anymore. So the physical needs are a systemic issue, both uh, from an individual point of view and also from a global societal point of view. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 26, the poor you will have, you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Sometimes this is used as a reason to explain the futility of helping the poor, but that's not, that's not how we should interpret what Jesus Christ is saying here. There's a scripture in Deuteronomy, which I believe he's quoting in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 11, where it says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land, your fellow Israelites. The idea here is that we should still be more generous with what we have. In this case here, Jesus Christ was responding to something Judas was saying. And Judas was trying to find a cause for criticism of Jesus in this, this juncture. And to distract from this lavish act of love 
to the Savior, which he was putting on this expensive oil, um, putting this expensive, expensive oil uh, on Jesus. So Jesus Christ was correcting the idea that any lack of love for him, any lack of love for Jesus Christ is never wasted. So he was correcting that idea. Although the poor will be always with you, we recognize that. But any act of love for Jesus Christ is never, ever wasted. And Judas was suggesting that this, this oil, which was very expensive, could have been sold for money and then this, could have been, this money could have been given to the poor. So he saw it as a waste and criticized Jesus for it. But he did not recognize that anything that is done for Jesus can never be wasted. And this is what the point Jesus was making. So I want to, we're starting out this way. The reality of this faith is, is that you, we, can, we can never really separate the needs of the physical and the spiritual. You know, I started out by saying, you know, look, look, let's separate the, there's two things, the needs of the brethren, physical and spiritual. But the way I look at this, the more I look at this closely, especially lately, uh, we cannot really separate the needs of the physical and the spiritual. They are not the same, but they cannot be separated in what I read from Scripture. And we'll talk more, a little bit more about that in a bit. I was thinking about this off and on for a while, for, for quite a while. Um, we see the migrants down in, uh, down coming through, through Mexico. We see this migrant crisis that is occurring in the southern border of the United States. And we hear a lot about this. And we talked about here on this channel how a seat, a Church of God minister, someone who's, again, who claims to represent Christ on earth here, denigrates them and denigrated them as a threat, as though that they're going to come up here and absurd the, the descendants of Israelites or whatever we want, however we want to look at it. So he denigrated them and looked them looked at them in a very poor way, uh, and and said, you know, these are these these people are a threat, and fulfilling prophecy, how the foreigner will rise amongst you. You know, where is the love there? You know, these poor people dealing with the situation, the circumstances that they're in. Where is the love there? And we'll we'll answer that, and, and as we go along. And so I really want to, and I looked at that and was like, wow, what, what is going on here? What kind of message is going around? What kind of message is being, being presented amongst Church of God, uh, amongst the Church of God culture? You know, I received a, a newsletter. I, re I mentioned it before, but I received a re weekly newsletter from a group up in North Dakota, and they include different articles from different contributors and I do look at them and uh, they come to the Shepherd's Voice uh, email and I, I have taken an exception to some of the the content of these some of the contributors uh, but there is one contribution from fellow he's, he's not part of those who put the the, the newsletter out to so make this clear but he he took an opportunity he says he he put a a short article in there uh, asking for help in their ministry and it's called the and I ha and I have it right here I printed it out this is maybe the sixth issue of the what's been what's been sent out and it's called brethren in need it's from this uh, Kenya Kenya hands of hope and I want to read what he says here and I, I do have some other correspondence that relates to it but let me let me read what he has to say here. It's very it's, it's relatively short compared to some of the other articles. But so it's under, under other items, uh, brethren in need by uh, William P. Goff. I believe I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but I'm sure it's close enough. He says here, 
Greetings, brethren, from your third world country, brethren. My name is Bill Goff, and a member of the Church of God. He is in, he's actually in Myrtle Beach. There are many in our impoverished there are many of our impoverished brethren living in third world countries around the world who need our help. I myself had my feet on the ground in East Africa for many years, especially Kenya and Tanzania. Most of our brethren are peasant farmers and suffer a lot. Some current needs include supplies for keeping the upcoming Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. They cannot afford Passover wine or flour for making unleavened bread, which is to be eaten each day on the seventh day feast. Many, he says, if not most, already are already rationing their food just for survival. It is, a, it is common to see people dying from starvation often in these impoverished countries. And he says, if you can help, that would be wonderful. No one here is on any payroll or anything like that. All funds reach the brethren. Please check our update page. It documents what we have been doing with the funds donated over the past many years. The link is here. And that link is included down down below. <clears throat> but it's the Kenya, Kenya Hands of Hope. And I wanted to talk to him I was I was trying to get get a hold of them for a few weeks. I I just haven't had, had had a chance, but I did want to talk to him, and I talked to him a week ago, last Sabbath, from the time of this recording. Uh, and I wanted to talk to him about a couple of things. I wanted to see how we can help them, help him what he was doing because his his ministry has come up before in other emails and now I'm finally trying to pay attention to see what we, we can do because there's many fraudulent uh, claims that come out of Kenya uh, that are targeted at the Church of God in North America or the United States so we need to be very careful but because he's had feet on the ground for a number of years I think I can trust him I have been approached by a number of different individuals emailing looking for help and this kind of thing but there's really no true way of verifying it it's very difficult so you have to connect with people that have actually had boots on the ground in in, in those areas that you can tell whether or not they're verifiably true or not that they're authentic so i want to talk to them about that and i also wanted to find a little bit more about their ministry but in addition to that, I, I, I received an email that was forwarded to me that he had put out to some other brethren that I'm, I'm familiar with. And he was talking about how a large, I guess the largest Church of God um, corporate institution, they were taking in close to $20 million a year or more, and he approached them to, for help. And even though that they sent their own ministry that was local in the area uh, to look at what he, who he's been working with, even though they found out that this is a legitimate group, that the group that he's working with there, who are Sabbatarians and Holy Day keeping individuals, even though they, uh, they understood their, their need, uh, they decided not to give them a penny, even though they put in pulling in about $20 million a year and spending most of it on headquarter activities. But he says here, but we have true brethren, true widows and orphans suffering horrendously, but they will not help or even inform the brethren of their suffering. And he points out here, this is this, this is a disgrace. This is a reality. And most of that organization don't really know what, about what's going on. So we need to pay attention to this kinds of things. I'm just putting it out there for your own consideration. And what he pointed out to me also, which caught my attention, is that I called him. Let me step back here. I did give him a call, and I wanted to talk to him about a couple of things and see how we could help. So we spoke last Sabbath, as I said, and uh, we, so we had a nice conversation. And he also uh, said how he reached out to a, another group, another corporate uh, group, of which I was formerly involved in, 
as well as Darren Connery and others involved in this ministry at Shepherd's Voice magazine. But he pointed out that he had a conversation with the, the president of that organization, and he was asking them for funds. But that president pointed out to him that, you know, he understood what he was asking, but he clarified something to him. He says that although we, you know, we present ourselves as a, a church, an organism, you know, the Church of God should be an organism, we really are, this business that we're in, or this, this church organization, is really a business. And I said to him, I know exactly who you were talking to, because he said the same thing to me a number of months before I departed that organization. And the same statement was made to Darren Connery as well, that in fact they really operate as a business. And so what he pointed out to this gentleman who heads up this Kenya Hands of Hope is that if we're going to put, invest money <laughs> or funds into something into Kenya, we would expect something in return. So it doesn't work with the business model. If we're going to expect something in return, we will, of course, expect our label to be put on this. We'll need them to be, become part of the organization. We'll need to have some money in return, something to that effect. So he didn't got, get a single dime out of them either, and I know they had enough money to assist. And that's the reality. I wish I can capture that in other ways, but unfortunately that is the reality. In corporate churches do operate this way. It's just the way it works. And I'm going to quote something here that uh, I have a quote that it was in uh, Wrestling with Evil an article, Wrestling with Evil, and you can find it in the links below as well. And I quoted something here from Gail Irwin from The Jesus Style. I just want to quote it because I think it's relevant. He says here, within a few years of the founding of almost all religious groups, they begin to take on the characteristics of the average business corporation. Nepotism reigns, they become ingrown and far removed from the thinking of their constituencies. That is here, I'm going to put, I'm parenthetically going to say, not the needs of the brethren. It's about the corporate objectives. It was the nature of Jesus to be given to persons. And I think that's a good characterization of Jesus Christ. And are you like him in this way? But be given to persons. It is the nature of an organization to be given to self-preservation. And I have seen this. I have seen the, the corporate world operate that way. I've seen the church corporate world, and I've seen the, my, my, my corporate experience in business operate this way. Self-preservation. The hiring and the firing is all about self-preservation. Self Anyone with a fresh insight or, or a prophetic word is stoned verbally or excluded from their, from their Jerusalem. That is, and he has, he has here in brackets, headquarters of the group. Only those who fit the prescribed pattern survive. So that's the reality. That's just the, that's the, that's just the hard truth. And I've seen there and I've, I, and I've seen this intimately. But both Darren and I have heard that statement from that organization, from the president of the individual. We are a business. So we look at it. When you look at it from that point of view, when you understand what a business does and what it's all about, it's about profit and loss. It's about gain. It's about territory. And I've seen this play it out in spades. All right. I don't want to belabor too much on the negative. I just want to put something out in reality. So we're going to do something to help this Kenya Hands of Hope. And if you would like to as well, it's up to your discretion. We'll put the link below, and you certainly can reach out to them and, and talk to them. <clears throat> By all means. By all means. I did an article some time ago called Kingdom Misconceptions. We will never have uh, this problem in the kingdom of God. So let's not despair. Let's not despair about this. 
we're not going to have this kind of political or these kinds of issues in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God doesn't have elements of man's idea ideas of governing or of any of these or men men's weaknesses either, because this is all born out of weaknesses, self-preservation. That's all. It's all. That's all a weakness, and it doesn't work. But it's not going to be in the kingdom of God. So none of man's government or whatever we try to do, try to build up some kind of institutional idea and collect, being some part of a collective to do a better work is not going to work because eventually it basically fails on its own merit. <laughs> I've seen this happen over and over. So you can take a look at that link uh, down below. I want to read, just based on what I've just told you, I want to read 1 John 3.17 so we can understand the seriousness of this nature. So 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? I hope that you can sink in just a little bit. Doesn't really. There's nothing to do with geography here. Doesn't have to do with what institutional motives we have. How does the love of God abide in Him? And again, we're dealing with brethren, our brothers and sisters, who have keep the Sabbath and the holy days, who have nothing to offer in return. Can we not help them? So we see here in this statement, though, we have the world's goods mentioned and also the love of God. So we have something here that is material, physical, and the love of God, which is spiritual. So the two can't really truly be separated, at least not in John's mind. Not in my mind either. Let's go to Luke chapter 6, and I'm turned here already, very conveniently, and I want to read this, this Luke's account of uh, some of the discourse here from Jesus Christ. And you can look at Matthew as well for something similar. But let's look at Luke chapter 6, and let's pick it up here in verse 30, just to pick it up somewhere. Can't read the whole chapter. Luke chapter 6, verse 30. Give to everyone who asks of you. Is that, what do we, okay, okay. <laughs> I think that kind of asks a question, answers a question, but let's carry on. We want to get this all and in, 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 in capture the context of what Jesus means in all this. And from whom, who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good for those, to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners than to sinners to receive as much back. I mean, it would be nice to receive it back. It would be nice. But let's just take it at face value what Jesus Christ was saying. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. It's not about investing. It's not about the stock market or anything like that or trying to get your name on things. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. And we'll, we'll take it from there in just a second. When we enter this faith, when we, when we enter this faith, we essentially take on a, sp a spiritual existence, do we not? Uh, my body's physical. I mean, sitting here, physical. I need water, and I, I 
many things in order to even come here and sit here and, and talk. Uh, but our life in Christ is in the Spirit. We're physical, but our life in Christ is in the Spirit. So our connection with the brethren is spiritual, which transcends time and space and geography and all these kinds of things. We need to work at it. Even our connection with the world is also spiritual, and how we interpret it, and how we relate to it. When you look at these teachings here, though, I want to make sure we're clear. When you look at these teachings and similar ones elsewhere, do not look at these things as a series of rules to be obeyed. Don't look at them as though those are the rules. You must always obey these rules. That's not what Jesus Christ is trying to impress upon his hearers. And that's you too and me. They describe an internal attitude that expresses itself positively in a negative environment. Or, another way to do, say it is generosity in a selfish environment. As we see here, here, love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing in return to your enemies. And the Father, the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. We see this. And we've talked about this in several other, in other presentations. So instead of getting angry at the world, and angrier, and getting other people angrier, look at things differently. The way Jesus Christ is telling you here, love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Be kind to the unthankful and, and the evil. Be merciful, just as your Father is also merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And as I talked about the, on the, in the first day of Unleavened Bread message, about how those are so, putting out so much angry messages and angry, angry articles putting out there, they're just so angry and getting everybody else angrier, getting all puffed up in their anger. That's not, that's not the way we, that's not healthy. That's not what God wants us to be doing. You know, you know, wrath, if there's going to be any wrath, you leave it up to God. I mean, it's not healthy for us. It's not healthy. And I think you understand what I'm saying. So generosity in a selfish environment. And how, it, how we uh, have an internal attitude that expresses itself positively in such, neg in such a negative <laughs> environment is what he's talking about here. In other cases where he says, you know, turn the other cheek, give him, you know, somebody slaps you on one side of the cheek, offer him the other. Now we need to understand this. It, this is an internal disposition he's talking about here. Not a set of rules. It's not a legal duty he's talking about. There's wisdom in all that we practice here as a people of God. It's done. Turn the other cheek if you would, but do it in wisdom. Because love... And this is what I learned years ago. Love also has a very discerning element to it. And you could look at Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapter 1 and then verses 9 to 11. How love has discernment. In other words, we've got to know when to claim our rights as a people, as a person, when if we are attacked. We've got to know how to manage this. But he's here, he's talking about not a set of rules, you must do this. He's talking about an internal disposition and how we relate to the world. It's spiritual now. But this is more about giving money, of course. It's about also about being uh, a good witness or ministering to others in this capacity. He says here in verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. Not just money, but your hope and your time and your generosity for across the board. Give, and it will be pressed, given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You can't get around that. 
So if we get angrier and angrier and we get other people's angrier, get other people angry, and we start denigrating other people who are less fortunate than us and consider them a threat, it's going to be measured right back to us. And if we're not thinking about the brethren or we're in need, and if people come to us and ask for help, with end wisdom, we need to respond. Not taking up some kind of corporate attitude, which is a terrible to shame, and it is a disgrace. It, it, I'm, just, I'm just ashamed to have ever been a part of it, to be honest with you. All this needs to be understood in terms of, of a true ministry. When I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm talking and making presentations, and I'm sure others feel the same way, especially in this part of this, this ministry, uh, what is some of the things that, that, that checking mechanism, so we know that we're still on the right page with God and his expectations to be aligned with his will? Paul said something here, and there's other scriptures to speak to this point. I can only think of what comes to mind when, when doing these presentations, when I look back over time in terms of the work that I've been involved in. Paul says here he was speaking to the Corinthians. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We preach not ourselves. And he says here, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verses 5 and 6. So we preach not ourselves. And this is something we really need to keep in check as we present ourselves to whether I can do it here on this on this on this YouTube channel or elsewhere. We want to be authentic in the message. As soon as somebody's politics or world concerns enter into the narrative or into what is being communicated or into that ministry, it, it becomes very suspect very quickly. And that's been dealt with quite a bit uh, in previous presentations on this channel. So you can always go to them. And in Romans chapter 15, well, let's turn there. We, we got, you know, we, we look at what our motivation is. What's our motivation and what we're trying to present? So Romans chapter 15, and we'll just read the verses 1, one through 3. When we who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. That's dealing with the need. Let each of us please his neighbor, for there is good leading to edification. So he's talking about here not to please ourselves. And he says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those who reproached me, who reproached you, fell on me. So we're not here in the business here of pleasing ourselves. That's another attitude we also need to adopt and understand. It's a spiritual motivation. It comes from God. We just can't create it, but we need to embrace it, as we'll further emphasize. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it talks about the needs of the brethren. And I'm going to try to uh, go through it quickly here. I don't want to get bogged right down in the text and all the circumstances that surrounded surrounded all this. Uh, but I just want to, I think it's worth you know, reading for, for what we want to accomplish here. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Now concerning the ministering of, to the saints, this is verse 1, it's super, superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians was ready a year ago. This was this was goes back a year ago, and some of them have lost their. <laughs> I think evidently, apparently, some have lost their zeal. But this is over a year old now, and that your zeal be stirred up, and as and your zeal has stirred up the majority. So, there. This is this is 
not something, this is one particular incident that happened on one occasion. This is something that happened that this goes back a year it's for some time. Let's pick it up here in verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's just the way it goes. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, this is a spiritual context here, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he who has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and, and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. There's a spiritual connection there. Something that's pleasing to God that goes beyond the physical realm. While you are enriched in everything for all... Well, let me skip here down to verse... I want to, don't want to break up the text. But in the, verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is the abound, is abounding through the many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God, God is glorified, which is the, f the highest objective we can reach, for your obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ. So it's tied in with the gospel. And for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by, the, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of your exceeding grace of God in you. And he says, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift and there's an exclamation point right there at the end you know we you know we see here that there's a spiritual connection through god's grace so giving doesn't go unnoticed by god and he and god is glorified here that's a very spiritual thing that is occurring so there's that connection we can't really separate the physical and the spiritual in this age that we live and since we have seen such a great gift, can we not participate in sharing that gift? I think is what Paul is saying. All right. What about spiritual needs? We've been talking about physical, you know, and physical and spiritual, but let's narrow it here. Let's just narrow it here for just a second on spiritual needs. I just want to focus on that. How do we concern ourselves with the spiritual needs of the brethren? giving a little bit of a pause. I mean, I've been thinking about these things as well. And as you, as I prepare my notes and things like that, we tend to really think about them. As we tune everything else out, start to think about what we're trying to communicate, what we're trying to zero in on. So how do we concern ourselves with the spiritual needs of the brethren? Do we actually have spiritual needs? Let me throw that in there, in the mix. Well, the answer to that question is, I'm going to say this. The answer is, we do not have spiritual needs. But this needs some elaboration. Just give me, give me, give me, give me some, give me some latitude here so I can come and bring this together. Just give me some, bring this together. And the reason why I say that uh, there's, a, there's a few scriptures I want to point out, and then we can come back to that, that territory where I think we're all more comfortable with. Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Let's read from here, from my notes. According to his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life. God has given us. And godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. All things that pertain to life he's given us. Let's go to Colossians here. 
I want to make sure I I have it in Colossians <clears throat> chapter 2 pick it up here in verse 9 and I've read these scriptures before and I, I am touched and feel confident in these scriptures for what they're saying and he's dealing with a certain situation here but let's read it Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. So the suggestion here is that we don't have a need. Just, but again, bear with me. And let's look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. Maybe this will help us segue into where I want to take us. So 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. The anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. His anointing teaches you about all things, and it is true and is not a lie, just as he taught you, remain in him. So it has happened where there's some of the saying, well, teachers are nice, but I don't need them at all. Using scriptures like a scripture like this, it, it, it does occur. And so, so be it if somebody wants to say that. But that's not what John is getting at here. What John means is that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate source of, of our illumination, the ultimate source of life, ultimate source of, of teaching. That is the ultimate source is what John is talking about here. He did not rule out secondary sources through whom the Holy Spirit was teaching. He didn't rule that out. And maybe there's tertiary sources as well. But he's not ruling that out. Otherwise, John <laughs> would not have written the epistle itself, would he? Though there's something there. So we can participate in this. The fullness of what Christ has provided for us. Let me elaborate that. We'll elaborate on that in just a second. And a couple of familiar scriptures to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. I'm just reading from the ESV here. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We know this. The sufficiency of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So we have that sufficiency in Christ. So the point is now that we can participate, you and I, we can participate in that spiritual sufficiency that we have in Christ. And this is what we need to do. That is, we share in that sufficiency. That is what I believe. And let me point that out here further in Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 10 to 13, and chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. Excuse me. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things, and that he personally gave some to be apostles. It's part of this sufficiency, I believe. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints and the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we reach, uni reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. I believe when I read this here, like we have the apostles. We don't need any today. We have them here. And we base a lot of the teachings that we have here. We want to get to the apostolic doctrine and what Jesus Christ has taught us about who we are in this faith, our identity, how to proceed. We need to grasp onto that, and hold on to it, and obey those words. And then Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4, everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. We have a part to play here. 
a serious part to play. We can't push it off and saying, well, they're too far removed and they don't meet our corporate objectives. All right. In Romans chapter 15, we read we were there earlier, but I have it here. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Paul says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. So here again, we have a role to play. And the term admonish here doesn't necessarily mean chastise. It actually means to exert positive pressure. Exert positive pressure. And I hope that perhaps is what I'm doing here right now exerting some kind of positive pressure. I feel, feel it myself. Because I'm trying to be helpful. So in the totality of this, we can go into the weeds further, but I have to pull away a little bit further. I have to pull away to try to collectively bring us together here. The objective is to help others recognize what they already have spiritually. And when we have that, we can be generous with what we have. We can obey God on those physical terms. We can recognize and out of our heart, be a joyful giver. Be someone who wants to reach out and do the things that are pleasing to him. We want to help others recognize what we already have. We cannot live the life we have in Christ until we first possess it. I'm not the first person to say this. But this, this is along the lines that I've believed for a long time. If there's anything in terms of the needs of the brethren, is to help them pos possess the life they have in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're trying to do here. And so we are working to bring our awareness and attention to that end here on this channel. I'm sure others are either. I mean, this is not an exclusive thing. I don't ever want that to be, be uh, ever, you know, don't want to ever create that impression. But we want to embrace the life we have in Jesus Christ. We have to possess it. And this is what ministry does. This is how we work with one another to make that happen. So we want to be able to, to possess the life and the liberty we have in Jesus Christ. And so much of that is to abide in love and faith and hope. As Paul said, that's the better way. We need to do this. We can't get distracted on other things. And there's ways of doing this. In order to execute this understanding, there are certain methods that we try to practice here and the best of my ability and others is to essentially, uh, I broke it down here, sometimes it requires exposing false ideas and attitudes. We need to expose them, saying we can't adopt this in our faith. We can't, you know, the first day of a love and bread message, for example, this comes to mind, we can't adopt angry attitudes. We can't adopt these various isms, Western exceptionalism and all these things. We can't take those on. Those are only a distraction. We need to expose those false ideas because all false falsehood or all lies have an element of bondage to them. And we've made that point very clear here. So we need to expose them intellectually or however. In other words, we just got to say it like it is sometimes. And maybe that's not comfortable for some, but this is what we're saying. And we need to show the right attitudes through Scripture that we need to adopt or recognize. We need to spiritually see them as they truly are. And various ministries have their style. I have my style in terms of how I present. Darren Connery, Pastor Purple Shirt, he has his style as well. And others have their style. And that's okay. I'm not concerned about style. I'm not concerned about any style at all. Uh, so if we're to abide in him and partake of that divine nature, nature, we need to naturally respond to the needs of the brethren. We need to be in touch. It needs to be something. I asked the question in the beginning. What do you think the needs of the brethren are? This is something we need to be seriously thinking about and it needs to be in front of us. 
locally and beyond and start locally if you if you need to but we need to be in touch with one another and these days it's been difficult but the technology exists that we can overcome it let's take take advantage of it our god is the god of comfort and paul tells it reminds us that uh repeatedly so we need to be the people of comfort as well and we need to look out for the needs of the brethren even though we may not know some we need to, with all wisdom and love and understanding, to pursue that end. And it seems, from what I see in Scripture, that God's God's expectations. So we need to take it very seriously. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 9 to 11, that's what I'm going to read here. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, that we should live together with him. And he says here, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you all are, are also doing. And I trust we are too. So brethren, I think I'll leave it at that. That's a lot to, uh, to take in. I hope that uh, this message was edifying to you. Give it the thumbs up. Do not be afraid to share the link to this message. Uh, maybe we'll, perhaps more subscribers and likes will give us the, expand the outreach uh, somewhat. I'm not going to stress over it. That's not really one of what we're what we're trying to do here. Is to trying to build something. We're trying to get the the right message out. So God bless all of you. Uh, thank you for watching. And we'll see you next Sabbath here on Shepherd's Voice Magazine YouTube channel. Take care.